chapter 7 is going to be all about work and energy, and we're going to be introduced to it through the concept of conservation laws. A conservation law basically tells us that a quantity before is equal to a quantity after. We already are familiar with some conservation laws. First of all, we have mass. Mass is conserved. Mass before some kind of collision is equal to mass after that collision. Quantity 2 will be the focus of this chapter, energy. Energy before something happens is equal to energy after something happens. And we'll talk more about what that means. And finally, we'll get into, eventually, the conservation of something called momentum. Conservation laws. They pervade physics and are very useful in solving a variety of problems. And to really understand what energy is and the conservation of it, we need to talk about a quantity known as work. Work basically has two characteristics. It's related to the force that you use to move something. Force to move. And how far that force moves it. So it's related to force to move and the distance that you move it. So what we have drawn in this picture up here. We have an x-axis, I have a y-axis, and here's my little guy, and he's got this car. He's going to push this car, and he's going to push it with some force. He's going to apply some force push to this car, and when he pushes it, it's going to move a certain distance. It's going to move from some initial position, we'll call it x-initial, to some final position, x-final. And that's going to be a distance delta x. Which gets us our general equation for work. Work is equal to the force to move something times the distance that you move it. The units of work are going to be equal to newtons times meters which has a special name, we call that a joule. J-O-U-L-E. Another useful thing to know about work is what the sign of it is. Is it positive or is it negative? And you can do positive work as long as the force that you apply is in the same direction as the change in position. You can, however, do negative work. This occurs if the force that you apply is in the opposite direction as the change in position. So I could have two situations. I can have a force applied to the right and my position moving to the left. I can have a force moving to the left and I could have my change in position moving to the right. So if my force and change in position are opposite directions, I have a negative force or negative work, and if my force and change in position are in the same direction, I have a positive work. To get some practice with this basic concept of work, I suggest you look at example two. and try check up seven dot one numbers one three six and seven now we can find a more general equation for force in the situation when we have a force being applied that's at some angle with respect to our change in position so let's say I'm applying an upward angle, angled force at an angle theta, and my change in position, and here I'm going to call change in position S, is, is at a different angle. So what I need to do here is select out just a little portion of the force that's moving in the same direction as my change in position. I'm going to call this F sub S. 
This is the force that's applied in the same direction as my motion. So I can write down my work equation. Work is equal to the force that's actually responsible for my change in direction, Fs, times S. We should be familiar with right triangles by now, and we can see this is the adjacent side of a right triangle. So this work is equal to the force that I apply times the cosine of the angle times the change of position. And this looks a lot like a mathematical quantity that we should know called the dot product, where the work is equal to F dot S. If we remember back to chapter 1 and chapter 2, the dot product picks out the component that goes in the same direction as your motion. So we can generalize this. F dot S is also equal to force times the change in position S times the cosine of the angle. And again, this is the scalar product. This is the dot or scalar product. So that means that work is a scalar. And we don't really need to worry about components. So let's generalize work a little bit more. What happens if the force that I'm applying is variable? In other words, the force I'm applying is changing. Maybe you're pushing a car and sometimes you have to push a little bit harder, sometimes you push a little bit softer. That's what we have depicted on this graph here with force in the x direction measured in newtons versus change in position measured in meters. So I can see that my force at position A to push this object is equal to two newtons, but it's changing. It's going up a little bit, then goes back down, and at this point B, the force that I'm applying is one newton. And the force is changing this entire time. It's moving. So how do I deal with this? Well, mathematically, I can separate this force into a bunch of tiny little components, tiny little pieces. I'm going to draw them as rectangles. And each force during this rectangle applies for the change in position that I use to draw the rectangle. Each one of these little guys has a slightly different force over a very, very small little change in position. So each force segment has a width, a tiny little width that tells me how wide my rectangle is. and I'm going to call that width delta x. So I have four segments of width delta x. So each one of those little guys has a width change in x and a height equal to whatever the force is. And each one of those forces is a little bit different. So I'm going to label it with a little f sub i. And what I can do is I can add up each one of these little force segments and get the total work required. So the work is equal to the sum from i equals 1, the very, very first little rectangle that I have, all the way up to i is equal to n, where n is the number of rectangles that you have. So I'm going to add up all the little forces, all the little heights of my rectangles of each ith rectangle times the width of each of those rectangles. And I can add up all of these between two points, between points A and B, to get the work of my variable force to move this object from A to B. So all I'm doing here is adding up all of these tiny little rectangles to give me my total force. Each one of these rectangles has a height f, 
and a width delta x. So each one of these is a tiny little bit of work. I add them all up to get the total work. And there's a shortcut we can use, a shortcut involving calculus that does exactly this. Now the shortcut from calculus that we should remember to add up a bunch of tiny little segments is something called an integral. We can think of this in other terms as adding up the area underneath the graph. That's what an integral does. So the work is equal to the integral from A to B of F sub X, the force as a function of X, times DX. So each one of these little variables tells you something very specific. That's the exact same thing as the summation that we just drew. Point A is your starting point for your motion. Point B is your end point for your motion. F sub x of x is the force that you apply. It's the height of your rectangle. dx is the width of your rectangle, how far you're moving it. So the force is the height, and the delta x is the width. And finally, this little integral symbol is just telling you add up all your little segments. So mathematically, this integral adds up or finds the area under a graph. And we'll generalize this to three dimensions in the next slide. So in 3D, our definition of work becomes the integral of f dot ds. Remember, this is a dot product. So the dot product selects out the components that are going in the same direction. So we can rewrite this in long form as an integral in three different directions. So this work equal to the integral of f dot ds is equal to the integral of f in the x direction times dx plus the integral of f in the y direction times dy plus the integral of f in the z direction times dz. So these equations are equivalent. Here we're understanding that this force and this, this ds are vectors and if we separate these vector components out into three dimensions, we get this most general equation for work. And it works all because of this dot product. Because the dot product picks out components that move in the same direction. So let's do a quick sample to see how easy it is to do these kinds of force problems. These work problems. Example four gives us a spring force, f sub x of x, is equal to negative kx. This is Hooke's law, it should look familiar. And we wanna know what's the work for the spring to bounce from point A to point B. So I can very easily write down that the work is equal to the integral from A to B of the force which here is f sub x of x times dx. And I can write this down again. The force from a, the, the work from a to b is equal to the force sub x of x. So this force, the equation that I have for it is negative k times x. So I'm just plugging in for what I know, times dx. If I'm doing integrations, I can pull out anything that's constant. My spring constant, negative k, is constant. All I need to worry about are parts 
inside the integral that have an x. So I can simplify this to negative k times the integral from a to b of x dx. I'm going to put a little exponent 1 here and use the following general formula for getting an integral. In general, the integral of x to the n times dx is equal to x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 evaluated at your two endpoints a and b. So for this case I have negative k times x to the 1 is now going to be x to the n plus 1 x to the 1 is equal to x to the n plus 1, and 1 plus 1 is 2, all divided by my n plus 1. 1 plus 1 is again 2, and I evaluate that at my points A and B. And here we need to remember, for evaluating integrals, the top number is the final and I subtract off the bottom number the initial. So in evaluating this integral I get negative k times the final so I plug in my b squared over a minus my initial which is going to be negative k again all I'm doing is evaluating this integral at the endpoints. Negative k divided by a squared over 2 And this gives me my work to move a spring from A to B. And all I needed to do was know this general integral equation. If you'd like some help on this, uh, feel free to stop by my office. If you want some more practice, try checkup 7.2, number 2. So the real purpose of the chapter is to understand this concept of energy. And to understand energy, we had to first understand work, because energy is the ability to actually do some work. We have a few different types of energy, and first we'll start with kinetic. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. So it's doing work based on speed. Work from speed. And we can get a view of what this is by looking at the definition of work. Work is equal to the integral from x1 to x2, two different positions, of some force that you apply times the change in position. But if we look at Newton's second law, we know that force is now not just F, F is equal to MA. So work is equal to the integral of the force. All I've done here is plugged in ma for force times dx. My mass is constant, so I can pull that out. So now I find that work is equal to mass times the integral from x1 to x2 of a times dx. But a is defined as the derivative of velocity. So I can pull a derivative into here to get the integral from x1 to x2 of a, where a is dv dt times dx. And what I'm doing here is trying to get my work in terms of velocities, in terms of v's. So I can find out how work is related to kinetic energy, because kinetic energy is work from speed. So I want to have this speed in here when I'm figuring out what work is in terms of kinetic energy. I can do this by making a substitution. I can change my integral to integrate over v instead of x. To do this, I have to realize that dv dt 
is equal to dv dx times v. This is a substitution that I can do, so I do this substitution. I plug in right here dv dt is equal to dv dx times v. So now I have that work is equal to the mass times the integral from x1 to x2, your initial position to your final position. I plug in my dv dx dv dx times my v times dx. And what I see here is my dx's are going to cancel out. And since I'm changing my units of integration over, I need to actually change the this x1 and x2 into velocities. I'm now integrating over velocity, over v. That was the purpose of changing my integral from dv dt to dv dx getting it so I can integrate over the velocity because work comes from speed so I want speeds so I just change my units of integration to, to velocities and I get that my integral for work is mass times the integral from v1 to v2 of v times dv So I have my equation now. My work is equal to mass times the integral from v1 to v2 of v dv. I can integrate this work using my general equation for how to integrate v to the first power, v1 to v2 of v to the first power over dv. This integral is equal to the mass times v to the n plus 1, here n is 1, so 1 plus 1 is 2, divided by n plus 1, so that's going to be 2, from the limits, velocity 1 to velocity 2. And I can further expand this out to give me m times my v squared over 2, we we'll use v2, minus my m times my v1 squared over 2. So I'm evaluating this at my endpoints, at my v2, my final point, minus my v1, my initial point. And I get this final equation that work is equal to mass times velocity 2 squared over 2 minus my mass times my velocity 1 squared over 2. And this is really, really convenient when we realize that kinetic energy, the energy from motion, is equal to 1 half mass times velocity squared. So the work that I just found is equal to the kinetic energy 2 minus the kinetic energy of 1. So in other words, work is equal to the change in kinetic energy within a system. This is something known as the work energy theorem. And to get practice with this kind of concept, this working with uh, work and kinetic energy, you'll want to try check up Seven dot three, and look at the problem solving techniques. The problem solving techniques on page number two eighteen. Now I don't only have kinetic energy; I can also have potential energy. Potential energy is based on position, and the most popular form is going to be gravitational. So how does this work? I can have a rock and I can drop that rock. The force of gravity is going to pull my rock down and it's going to end up landing on the ground. I can 
write my positions for the rock. I have some initial position Y1, some final position Y2. So the work that's going to occur on this rock is equal to the force of gravity, the force that's pulling it down, times its change in position, Y1 minus Y2, how far the rock falls. So work is M times G, FG is MG, times Y1 minus Y2. But we know already that energy is the ability to do work. In this case, gravity is the quantity that is doing the work for me. So I want to know how gravity uh, energy works in relation to work. So gravitational potential energy, which we denote with a U, is equal to the mass of an object times gravity pulling on that object times its position. So my initial potential energy that I have for this rock is m times g times y1, how high up that rock is. This should look very, very similar to my work equation. My work equation has m times g times y1. My final potential energy is equal to m times g times y2. Again, this is very similar to my work. So it looks a lot like I'm doing a change in, in potential energy here. My work is equal to m times g times y1 minus m times g times y2. In terms of potential energy, this is u initial minus u final. So work looks very similar to a change in potential energy. But usually change in potential, change in anything, is final minus initial. So to do that, I need to take a negative out. So I can do that. I can change my negatives around so that I have negative u final minus u initial. I didn't change anything. I still have my negative uf and my positive u i, u initial. All I'm doing here is writing this in a more common form. Changes in objects are usually the final minus the initial. So I can use this to see that work is equal to the negative change in gravitational potential. This is a little bit different than the work energy theorem, which tells us that work is equal to the positive change in kinetic. So that's something to keep in mind. Work is the negative change in potential energy, but the positive change in kinetic energy. So we get to now a very special case of if gravity is the only force acting. Then what we can find is that the kinetic energy that I have, the energy due to speed, plus the potential energy that I have, the energy due to gravity, is equal to a constant. And that constant we can call just the total energy inside of a system. And this brings us to the conservation of energy, where E initial is equal to E final. So if gravity is the only force acting, I know that all the energy I have at the beginning is going to be all the energy that I have at the end. So I can write this more generally as K initial plus U initial is equal to K final plus U final. Or write this out even more, K initial is one half mass times V initial squared plus u initial is m times g times y initial is equal to one-half mass times v final squared plus m times g times y final. 
And what I see from this equation is that energy simply changes forms. So with my example of a rock, I take my rock and I drop it. I drop it from an initial height of y initial. I can write the initial potential energy that I have, u initial, is equal to m times g times y zero. I drop it from rest, so I can see that my kinetic energy initial is going to be zero, because my initial velocity is zero. So I'm taking a whole bunch of potential energy here, mg y zero. Once I hit the ground, on the ground, y final is equal to zero. If y final is zero, then u final has to be zero. But right before I hit the ground, I've taken all that kinetic energy and I've converted it in, or all that potential energy and converted it into final kinetic energy. So my kinetic energy is going to be much greater than zero. So in this case of a rock falling, I have no initial kinetic energy and no final potential energy. So I'm just taking all my initial potential and converting it into speed for that rock at the bottom of its path. So energy doesn't go away. Energy changes forms. And that's something we'll work with more and more as the semester goes on.